Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is James Claiborne. I'm director of programming here at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. I'd like to welcome you to a very special edition of our midday uh, tour and talk called Art Break. In this uh, pandemic moment, we have uh, moved this program into digital formats and very recently have brought it back into our galleries. Typically, we'd be walking through our galleries, uh, but in commemoration of the upcoming Juneteenth and July 4th holidays, uh, we have invited the incredible Dr. Gabrielle Foreman to be a part of today's talk uh, to help us explore the histories tied to both of these holidays and to look at them through the lens of, um, of her research and artwork. Uh, I will tell you that the museum is getting ready to launch a incredible series of program, Freedom to Liberty, uh, in partnership with Visit Philadelphia and Wawa Welcome America. This is our official kickoff uh, to this program, uh, but on Saturday, the museum will have a Juneteenth festival. Uh, we'll be offering free admission to our gallery spaces, courtesy of Wawa. Uh, that is timed admission, so if you're interested in exploring our galleries uh, as part of the Wawa offer, we encourage you to go to ampmuseum.org and reserve your tickets in advance. They're moving quickly, so if you think that's something you want to do, please be sure to go to our website today um, and sign up. We have four or five slots starting at 10 a.m. that you can experience our galleries. And then the rear of our museum in the parking lot, we'll have a great activation uh, Wawa will be on site giving away smoothies. We'll have a live sound stage featuring the incredible talents of V. Shane Frederick, Warren Ori, and the Arpeggio Jazz Band. Nina Lirispec Ball uh, will be bringing poetry. We'll kick off with Universal African Dance Company, and then we'll have activities for youth, children, and families, uh, along with food trucks and vendors. So there's, this will be a great day to stop by the museum um, and experience all that we have to offer. So I I encourage you to go to our website, learn a little bit more about our Freedom and Liberty celebration in partnership with Visit Philadelphia and, of course, Wawa Welcome America. And at this point, I'd like to call to the stage uh, our, uh, our fearless leader, our VP of Programming, Ivan Henderson, who will introduce today's program and our speaker for today. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to thank James Claiborne. Um, so please put your hands together for him. Whether you know him or not, um, this is what he does. He stalks around behind programs, making sure that everything goes right. Uh, he does all the planning on the front end, a bunch of what you've seen from this museum over the past uh, several years. So we got a strong team. We're really close. Um, but James is an essential part of that team. So James, I just want to thank you for um, hearing my ideas and, and making them into realities um, through these programmatic outputs. Uh, so I wanted to start there and you'll hear that a lot from me over the next several days because um, none of this happens without every single person on our small team. Uh, but once again, uh, this person has been a focal point uh, for me trying to get these things to happen. So thanks to the whole team. Thank you, James. It's a wonderful, beautiful day today. It's not too hot. The sun is shining. I feel great. I want to welcome you to the African American Museum in Philadelphia on behalf of our staff, the small army of volunteers that support us, our board, um, and the communities we serve. Uh, we are uh, happy to be a, a meeting place, a community forum, and now uh, we're able to sit outside with you, but even the public health scenario says that we'll be able to get to do a, a little bit more of that moving forward. So thank you all for helping us kick off this Juneteenth through July 4th, Freedom Through Liberty season by being here with us today, uh, but also this is only the beginning of a uh, AMP coming back, um, if you will. And what better way to do it? Uh, you heard James talk about Freedom to Liberty as our thematic approach to the next several weeks. Uh, I thought I wanted to talk to a scholar and have an art break conversation, an object-based conversation uh, around these ideas, the connection between freedom and liberty. And uh, who better to do it uh, than one of my friends and colleagues uh, who I met back at University of Delaware, uh, but I'll read her bio now and you'll find out she's much more uh, than my friend and colleague. Dr. Gabrielle Foreman is the founding faculty director of the award-winning Colored Conventions Project, which brings seven decades of early black organizing to digital life. She is the author of four books and collections including The Colored Conventions Movement, Black Organizing in the 19th Century, 
the first edited collection to address the little known precursor to the NAACP and the Black Lives Matter movement. Dr. Foreman is also known for curating the widely adopted guide, writing about slavery, teaching about slavery, this may help. And for her attention to creating and supporting leaders who further diversify universities, libraries, and cultural institutions. She has served as a consultant for universities focused on recruiting and retaining scholars of color and as an advisor and mentor for hundreds of scholars. Dr. Foreman holds the Paternal Family Chair of Liberal Arts and is a professor of English, African American Studies, and History at Penn State University, where she is the, found, where she is the founding co-director of the Center for Black Digital Research. Uh, but I can say beyond that, a friend that I met working at University of Delaware, and I, you know, I said to James and to others, I was looking for intellectual fire uh, to set the tone and to set us off on the right foot as we explore these ideas. Dr. Foreman was the first call I made, and I'm glad she answered that call. Uh, so with that, I give you our speaker for today, Dr. Gabrielle Foreman. We're here together, aren't we? Praises, we got here. I wanna start by saying thank you to the African American Museum of Philadelphia for this invitation to inaugurate this Juneteenth to July 4th commemoration. And additional appreciation goes to Ivan Henderson, my friend and colleague, for the expansive ideas we'll address today, pondering what these two holidays mean in relation to each other. What would it mean to think about the 15 days between Juneteenth and July 4th as the pedestrian bridge we all walk over to link the democratic aspirations that the 4th of July articulates to the embodied freedom for black Americans that Juneteenth has come to represent? What would it mean not only to commemorate the genesis stories of this country's contested foundings, but to invite yearly returns to the days between Juneteenth and July 4th as dynamic time in motion with learning, sharing, action, and reflection that would allow us not only to celebrate the rhetoric of the U.S.'s most important national holidays, but also to grapple with the living legacies of those histories. Let's start with Glenn Ligon. Since this talk is scheduled during AMP's art break and since this image is so evocative in a discussion of the dynamic timelines that both can join and separate Juneteenth and July 4th. So you have that piece in front of you. I love this piece. I love it for loads of reasons. It's a numeric grid, right? Starting in 1776 and marching through messy time. And it gets murkier and harder to read, harder to understand as it goes on, like the history that followed the US's declaration uh, for liberty and justice for, for all, which was followed by gradual emancipation in slave states such as Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey, while southern states doubled down. And they doubled down on enforced bondage as first Haiti, and then Mexico, and then Bolivar South America, and then the British Empire, and then the French Empire, and then the Danish Empire all ended the institution, leaving only Cuba and Brazil to trail behind the US. So I just love the way it gets messy, right? Starts clear, gets messy. Then if you really peer in and look carefully at the numbers, not images or words, right? And how many paintings that we, do we have that are just sort of numeric grids, right? The painting uses to represent history through these numbers, you'll see that numbers are missing. The painting seems to ask us, who reads history this closely? What do we miss? What's hidden and occluded when we don't look closely? I'm also taken by the painting's black numbers stenciled on a bright red ground, which you know reminds me of Juneteenth too, right? You know, with the red Kool-Aid. The ways in which the, repeti the repetitious use of the stencil, which disintegrates over time with each use, bleeds and blots, smearing the image and casting shadows on any idea that time marches on cleanly, that it brings us any closer to justice just by moving forward. And what do we do when 
History isn't easy to read. When it doesn't march forward with ease, the painting seems to ask. Ligon doesn't organize this grid cleanly as he could have each line ending with a full year in fours. Right, take a look, right, does it end? He could have ended right after 1780, right? But he breaks it 17, right? You see that? It could have gone in fours, 1776, 1777, 1778, 1779, clean break, right? Like a poem with perfect end rhyme. Instead, the jumbled numbers carry over from one line to another. In jammed in poetry's parlance, each subsequent line not only ending but starting with a number that's hard to parse, with no spacing to help us in discernment. I also love the way the painting leaves viewers with the responsibility of discernment in the middle of its messiness. Its grid stopping not only mid-line, but also two-thirds through the canvas, which acts here also as a page, asking readers to finish the counting, to finish the accounting, to finish writing history, to take responsibility for the painting's ground, for the history our country's grounded in. Today, as we ponder 1776 and 1865, not in terms of which came first historically, but in terms of where they fall as they roll around every year, Juneteenth 1st, two weeks before July 4th, Looking at the provocations Ligon's painting offers us in connection to Amp's invitation to think through the dynamic relationship between these two holidays also lets us consider what it means to flip the timeline and reconsider the force in light of the ways we encounter these two soon-to-be national holidays. Reading Juneteenth as an invitation to complete the promise of the Declaration of Independence and the work that's still on the page that's still left to be done. Let's spend a moment revisiting Juneteenth's history. In June 1865, as many of us know here, the Union Army put an exclamation point on the Confederacy's military losses. In spite of Robert E. Lee's Appomattox surrender in April 1865, Southern troops had continued to fight, extending both enslavers' hopes and the end of the Civil War for Texas for months on end. About 180,000 enslaved people, including the grandparents of my beloved grandmother, had been living in Texas when South Carolina seceded. Texas had been seen as a stronghold of slavery, so strong that as the war progressed and New Orleans fell, enslavers from adjacent states such as Louisiana and Mississippi the states my granddaddy Foreman's people call home, had crossed into the Lone Star State to keep hold of the black labor and lives they felt ensured their wealth and their reputations. They forced tens of thousands of people they claimed as property over the state border with them, calling themselves refugees as they fled the Union Army, trying to thwart the complicated freedom the Army left in its wake for the millions of once enslaved people who found themselves behind Union lines, more than half a million of whom had liberated themselves during the war, making their way to freedom's jubilee months and years before Juneteenth. On June 19th, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in, in Texas. As the new U.S. commander of Texas troops, one of his first orders of business was to make the news of freedom official in one of the last outposts still gripped by slavery's tight hold. He stepped onto the balcony of Galveston's Ashton Villa, the former headquarters of the Texas Confederate Army, as legend and many sources have it, and read General Order Number 3. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free he said, referencing Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. He went on to declare, this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. Gesturing toward the coming post-war amendments that would assure the end of slavery in 1865, 
and three years later, promise equal protection under the law, those loyal to the Confederacy and slavery were so outraged that in one town, according to Pulitzer Prize winning historian Annette Gordon-Reed, dozens of free people were whipped for celebrating that freedom on that first June 19th. But celebrate they did. Juneteenth, then Jubilee Day, was commemorated in Texas for years, and it was also a day to assert not only personal, but political and economic equality by the time the 15th Amendment was passed. By 1872, black leaders in Houston raised $1,000 to collectively purchase 10 acres to celebrate black freedom. That property, now Emancipa Emancipation Park Conservancy, still serves our communities. Juneteenth spread as generations of Texans relocated to other states, and it received renewed attention when activists and community scholars trained their eyes on the social and legal legacies of approximately 250 years of U.S. racial slavery, such as when, after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1868, about 75,000 people gathered on the Mall at the resonant setting of Lincoln's memorial for the Poor People's Campaign Solidarity Day, held on June 19th. Participants had traveled from throughout the country to rally against food deserts and structural poverty, and to advocate for fair housing, labor justice, and equal rights under the law. Scholars suggest that as people went home to continue their quest for freedom and democracy, the seeds of Juneteenth spread with them. Today, it's celebrated in all but a handful of states. Here in Pennsylvania, we have Ron Johnson and a collective of, of, of other activists. Are there any here? So that we can acknowledge any of the folks who may have been working for June 19th. I'm sure we know people who have been doing that. And to thank them for their work that culminated into, into June Juneteenth being signed into law as an official state holiday on June 19th, 2019. Soon, once the U.S. House of Representatives follows the Senate's unanimous vote just days ago, it will be a national holiday. Juneteenth, yes. <laughs> Our own personal jubilee right up in here, right? Juneteenth serves as a symbolic commemoration of African American freedom that is as aspirational as it is celebratory. It's not actually the first or the oldest holiday to commemorate U.S. slavery's long overdue demise. It follows on the heels of the first watch night, which so many of us from black communities continue to celebrate as we gather together in churches across the nation to greet the new year in community. The first black woman to travel from the anti-slavery, to travel with the anti-slavery society poet, novelist, and the longtime Philadelphian Francis E.W. Harper captured it this way. Mrs. Prayed up in the parlor that the Setches all might win. Mrs. Prayed up in the parlor that the Setches all might win. We were praying in the cabins, wanting freedom to begin. Many of us who don't claim Texas roots, I'd wager, knew about our own local black celebrations or about watch night before we learned about Juneteenth. First celebrated on Freedom's Eve in 1862, watch night was inaugurated as those who stood against slavery stayed up in late night anticipation and witness to Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and its symbolic promise to bring liberty and freedom for all, that is to more than those in the Confederate states who had boldly claimed that the President of the United States had no power, no influence, and no dominion. I'm waiting for an amen from, all right. I think most of us know that the proclamation um, didn't really free many slaves, right? It was an aspirational document. So it freed folks who weren't under the Union. And it accepted, it accepted, or ex yes, accepted. That will work today, right? Okay, um, all of the slave holding, slave holding states that stayed true to the Union, right? So again, we have the Emancipation Proclamation like the Declaration of Independence as an aspirational document. Nor was Juneteenth the day that finally brought freedom to the last of those 1800, 18, uh, 
180,000 enslaved ancestors in Texas. It's the passing of the 13th Amendment and its assurances that neither slavery no, nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, shall exist within the U.S., which was ratified almost six months after Juneteenth that actually did that. It's that constitutional amendment that marked liberation for the last communities held in bondage in Texas, as well as those in states like Kentucky and nearby Delaware, that is, again, the slaveholding states that earned exceptions from the Emancipation Proclamation in return for their loyalty to the Union. It's also worth recalling that Africans in the Americas never pinned their hopes solely on U.S. declarations of independence and freedom that didn't yet extend to us. When it won the battle against British and French armies and gained its independence, Haiti also became the first nation in the Western Hemisphere to ban slavery. In 1804, more than six decades before Juneteenth and the 13th Amendment, the first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, started in 1827 in New York State. While slavery in that northern state was in its final throes is still, published a series of articles, fiction, and debate about Haiti carefully examining it as a model of freedom and liberty that rivaled the not yet fulfilled words of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. In his twilight years at a major address at the 1893 World Fair where Frederick Douglass partnered with Ida B. Wells, Douglass offered not only admiration, but as he put it, gratitude to the island nation. She has grandly served the cause of universal human liberty, he declared. We should not forget that the freedom you and I enjoy today, that the freedom that 800,000 colored people enjoy in the British West Indies, the freedom that has come to the colored race the world over, is largely due to the brave stand taken by the black sons, and I will add the black daughters, of Haiti 90 years ago. When they struck for freedom, they built better than they knew. Their swords were not drawn for themselves alone. They were linked and interlinked with their race and striking for their freedom, they struck for the freedom of every black person in the world. When 19th century anti-slavery activists celebrated Emancipation Day on January 1st, they were also celebrating Haiti's Independence Day. Free black people and abolitionists in the Americas and Europe also joined the diasporic celebration of Great Britain's 1834 August 1st manumission. How many folks here have folks from Jamaica or Nassau or any place in the, in the British, in what used to be the British, right, Caribbean? They still celebrate August 1st. Blacks in the U.S. joined in hosting events also held across the British Empire and the United States, where crowds into the thousands came out to hear the most eloquent black pre speakers, preachers, educators, writers, and organizers of that era year after year. In the three decades between abolition across the British Empire and emancipation in the United States, U.S. slavery expanded and the rights and freedoms of free blacks eroded and rapidly. As universal free suffrage spread, the rights that blacks who were free had enjoyed were snatched away. State laws that had laid fallow and unenforced sprung up and spread. And not only in the South, in the city of brotherly love, where the Constitutional Convention was held and the Color Convention movement was born, for example, blacks across Philadelphia who had voted for decades lost that right in the 1830s. In the North and in the South before the war, not just after Reconstruction's end, black people were violently excluded from political participation. And I think we really need to pay attention to this, right? Because this is the ways in which free blacks' vo vo voting rights, sh sh can we all say that together? Voting rights, right? Voting rights, rights to gather, rights to mobilize, rights to teach in their own schools, right to teach what they wanted to teach, all of that was eroded while we were supposedly free, right, in the North, right? So there is a tradition of that eroding tradition that I think we really do need to pay attention to. In 1860, we, this is before the war, 
and by we I mean not only the black but also the male version of me, could only vote in five of 33 states. What does that mean? That means free blacks in the US, very few could vote. Only 3% of African Americans in the entire US could vote before 1860, right? So this is, listen, <laughs> we need to listen. All of this is access to the vote for non-land-owning -land whites and new white immigrants expanded. Noting the cruelty of democratic rhetoric that obscured black realities for those in the U.S. North as well as the South, black people celebrated emancipation on August 1st to commemorate freedom across the British Empire in explicit contrast to the U.S. Independence Day. No stranger who happened to be in the States on the 4th of July and heard the constant declaration about liberty, proclaimed Sarah Riemann, who hailed from one of the most famous black activist families of her time, would for a moment dream that one portion of its people were groaning under a hopeless despotism. Referencing the Dred Scott decision as well as slavery, she noted that the broad swath of Victims of this despotism were under the feet of the oligarchy, which controlled the government of this country. She and her brother Charles, Frederick Douglass's most trusted companion in his anti-slavery travels, Douglass named a son after him, joined the lions of the era as orators at huge and ubiquitous annual August 1st celebrations. Today, we continue what Howard University professor Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie calls the festive politics blacks practiced as they commemorated and advocated for freedom. The speeches they gave in connection to annual celebrations had even greater reach through published pamphlets and newspaper coverage that blanketed those sympathetic to the cause. They spread the word like social media, YouTube, and live streaming does today. In perhaps the most famous U.S. Independence Day speech for black America, Frederick Douglass stepped to the podium and posed questions millions before and after him ponder. What have I, or those I represent, have to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Both Riemann and Douglas spoke in the decade before the Civil War during an era marked by laws that upended black life and liberty not only at the hands of the state legislatures as they repealed voting rights in state after state across the nation, protested educational equity and access, and as black communities faced more and more white violence and aggression without the protection of the law. Increasingly, black life was threatened with outright assistance from the US Congress and the Supreme Court itself. Most folks listening today know that legislative acts we call the Fugitive Slave Law sanctioned paying special commissioners in the North twice as much to affirm a black person about to be hauled into slavery was a fugitive than to affirm a black person was actually free. And most of us know about the infamous Dred Scott Supreme Court decision which declared that blacks, you can say it with me, had no rights that whites were bound to respect. Until the Civil War and the short promise of what Francis Harper called a brighter coming day, blacks in early commemoration events expressed frustration with the liberty and justice rhetoric that many whites in America claimed for just us, that is for just their kith and kin. When in this boasted America, the American people beyond all others were making greater professions of liberty than any other nation about what in 1859 Sarah Riemann ironically called their Declaration of Independence. Those who stood against slavery were keenly aware of the success of global and diasporic freedom movements that didn't yet include the U.S. in their number. As a result, until 1865, many people celebrated days of freedoms for their states 
or across the diaspora instead. And I think that, you know, there's been lots of conversations. People have been calling me, I don't know about you, to say, well, you know, I didn't celebrate Juneteenth coming up, right? Like, I celebrated my state, my state holiday, right? Like, when state freedom happened. I celebrated Emancipation Day, people have been saying to me. But Juneteenth builds on this long history of a variety, right, of black freedom festivals. As we began, we were supposed to hear, and we will hear, and we will recite to get today, Tracy K. Smith, Poet Laureate's reading her declaration. It's a found poem, as we call poetry that was first found as something else. Overheard words on the street, legal documents, national proclamations. Tracy K. Smith, two-time Poet Laureate of the United States, whittled this piece from the U.S. Declaration of Independence, redacting some of Jefferson's words, much as the Constitutional Committee charged with its authorship did, to carve out a declaration of our very own. No amount of barbecue or red soda water can wash away the haunting taste of it. I'm inviting all of us to read it together, starting with the title, taking time to feel and fill in the empty spaces, each at our own pace, collectively and in cacophony, as we've done with so much that's kept us together and in community. We ready? All right. Declaration. We has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He has plundered our, ravaged our, the lives of our, taken away our, abolishing our most valuable, and altering fundamentally the forms of our, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here, taken captive on the high seas to bear. In those spaces of redaction, those empty spaces on the page, the poem invites us to stand in both collective spaces, the repeated R of both declarations, followed by those dashes that act as rendings, as tears in the national fabric that call for the declaration we've just read, that speaks to the experience of, of those not fully covered by our nation's founding documents. In the empty space on that page, the poem gives us space to personalize this declaration. It offers space to imagine, to silently declare what has been plundered, altered, ravaged, taken away from us, but also from you, specifically, your family over generations, the community you claim as home. And to add that together into the collective R, where both the Declaration of 1776 and this one stake their claims. This poem gestures towards a national sharing as it makes visible or makes space to see black loss, black petitioning, black bearing, or the loss of any group. Black people are not mentioned in any way in this poem at all for which the Declaration of Independence does not yet speak without deferral or without irony. Still, this is carved out of the most foundational words of our shared nation. Tracy K. Smith notes, I am not the speaker of this poem. I feel like the document is trying to tell us something. And by using it as the basis of her work, she goes on, we are looking to one of the nation's most foundational texts for guidance and also for hope. Crafting declarations that speak to our dash, different experiences from the words that shape our shared nation, also points to how those of us occupying the same ground, giving life to the same words, sometimes do so in different time and tempo, 
like those who clap on one in three while the rest of us move steadily through a song through the world on two and four. Recognizing Juneteenth nationally, I would venture, is an acknowledgement of just that. For those who have worked for years to make it happen at least, placing it on the national calendar is an attempt to recognize the paradoxes and irony that we've examined today. It signals an aspiration to sync up liberty's calls and freedom's soundings so that we can hear through them as a nation together. So how do we mark the conclusion of racial slavery in the United States? How do we celebrate Juneteenth when we've experienced so many ersatz and incomplete endings? How during these days between Juneteenth and July 4th do we mark our multi-generational race towards freedom in the face of so much drag and resistance and after so many false starts that are only momentary jubilees? How do we make sense of the all-night faith and commitment to the democratic and deferred dreams of a community in witness? We've inherited a long history of festive politics that have always changed over time. And that's what makes the African American Museum of Philadelphia's programming this year, their call really to link Juneteenth and July 4th, both so evocative and so concrete. How might the nation celebrate not just these two days in June and July, but activate the time in between them to make them our nation's high holidays as a love your neighbor as yourself time of reflection and learning and return and remaking like Lent or Ramadan or the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur where we confess collectively and take responsibility for our actions as a community so we can move forward together. In the 15 days between Juneteenth and July 4th, we can throw or go to backyard barbecues and events like this one and pass on the history of liberation commemorations. We can commit to doing one thing a day that revitalizes democracy in ways that assure, using General Granger's words, personal equality, and also political rights and the cultural vibrancy that has always been our community and this country's strength. During this secular Lent, this national moment of teshuva, this shared practice of meditation, we can commit to visiting a black museum and better still, to joining one or renewing our memberships. We can support black institutions, as so many of us do all the time, with our energy, our resources, and our expertise. We can hold family and community meetings to discuss real commitments that will impact our local communities. We can call our state and U.S. Congress people and senators and city council, council members every day between Juneteenth and July 4th. We can visit their offices and demand they ensure what those who have fought for freedom across the centuries advocated for, voting rights, educational justice, and for laws that assure that if all of us are created equal, that we must erase the huge gender and racial pay gaps for positions that call for the same qualifications and the same experiences. Activating the days between Juneteenth and July 4th gives all of us an opportunity to imbue this aspirational democracy with what it deserves. In doing so, we can claim not only a story of different or displaced beginnings, but one of collective return and renewal. In this way, Juneteenth to July 4th is an invitation as much as it is a commemoration, one that still resonates with meaning and promises, broken and beckoning. Thank you. <laughs> Ivan and I are gonna take an opportunity to talk to each other about some of this and to engage in conversation and questions with you. What did I tell you, intellectual fire. Um, <laughs> So I won't, I won't tell you the word, 
Uh, but I will say that I, I tell this story. The first day I met Dr. Foreman, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Harvard graduate, English degree from Harvard. I know words. First day I met her, she dropped a word on me that I, I had to like kind of go through my bem memory banks. And she just slid it into a regular old conversation. I was like, oh, sister's deep. I want to I wanna stay close to her. I want to hear her speak. I want to read her writing. And uh, luckily, we were able to, um, in very natural and iterative ways, get to know one another when we work together at University of Delaware. Uh, but I think my, my best talent in museums is not forgetting the smart people I run into <laughs> and finding the right time uh, to have them speak, uh, or use this as a platform and speak to our people. So thank you, um, you know, a thousand times uh, for being here today um, and for doing this. I can also tell you, we, we have to plan our work, you know, months in advance. I, I would love to sound clever, but um, we didn't, none of the things that have occurred over the past couple days uh, the legislative moves were were impending uh, when we started talking. Um, as luck would have it, although it's not luck, uh, we, we're here today listening to Dr. Foreman uh, talk about these things at the exact right time, the exact right moment. And the best thing we could do is be in place and be ready. Um, and so thank you for helping us do that. Um, but I did want to, you and I wanted to do a little conversation um, and a little Q&A. Um, and so I know we've got a couple of questions here. Um, and I guess I'll start out because during the introduction, I talked about your involvement with the Colored Conventions Project and, and your leadership there. And in fact, that's what you were doing also when I first met you. Um, the Colored Conventions Project takes us through documents and through history into the era, um, you know, right after 1865 or right around 1865 as black people were finding political agency and, and, and tuning, fine-tuning their voices. Uh, but I'm not sure everyone knows everything about it. So will you please talk to us about the Color Conventions Project, what it means, and, and where it is in relation to this conversation. So um, everybody in this space knows about um, Mother Bethel, right? So, and the first color convention was held at Mother Bethel in 1830, and from it followed 70 years of black state and national organizing for educational rights, labor rights, and most of us don't know about this, even though it included the lions of the era. Every single person you know about from the 19th century was, you know, included and active in it. Probably, if some of you all are from Philadelphia, probably your ancestors were involved, um, including um, a, a laundrix, Rachel Nelson, um, who worked as a laundress, right? A la a laund she worked in laundering, who was a delegate to the 1855 Philadelphia National Convention. So I was interested in kind of looking at what they were saying about the Declaration um, through um, the documents that they brought together. I, it's really important, I think, for us to realize how much black organizing precedes white organizing on our behalf, right? So 1830, when people gather in Mother Bethel for that first national gathering, that's a year before the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society is formed. It's three years before the American Anti-Slavery Society is formed. Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper, appears before William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, right? So we have been organizing on our own behalf for ourselves powerfully, resonantly, right, for many, many years. And the question is, why is that history not preserved, right? Why, why are we not taught that history? And I think that's really, really the question today as state after state is are passing laws, right, to say we cannot teach a history that really includes um, the ways in which blacks were excluded from all of the rights or so many of the rights, how they were unevenly distributed and how we organized and fought um, in order to roll back um, some of those exclusionary politics. So I'm gonna just read a couple. The Declaration of Independence is not yet fairly carried out, says the minutes of one of the conventions, nor will it be until in every corner of the land, the black as well as the white, I'm excising man here. They say the black man, but I'm, I'm, I'm just excising the man part. The black as well as the white is permitted to enjoy all the franchises pertaining to citizens of the United States of America. I love that word, franchises, right? I also love this sister back here who stopped in her car to join us, okay? Welcome, all right. Um, to enjoy the franchises, plural, 
to think about our rights right at the voting box as being the thing that ensures the multiplicity of rights that comes after that, right? So that is one of their quotes. And then I love this one too that comes out of the minutes of the State Convention of Colored Citizens of, of um, Pennsylvania convened in Harrisburg. They say, let us rest our cause on the Republican standard of the Revolutionary Fathers while we knock at the doors of the Constitution and demand an entrance. So, you know, I think, it, you know, one of the interesting things is that we can go back to our own documents and make sure they're freely and, and accessible. And they are now at colorconventions.org. You can go and look at all of these documents. And to make sure that we understand our own legacies of protest, right? Our own legacies of involvement. Um, because um, society has conspired in many ways and circumstances have conspired in many ways to make sure those documents are not actually made available to us. So we can make them available to ourselves, for ourselves, um, and, and spread them through ourselves. So Ivan, thank you for that question. No problem, thank you. Now, um, I know you gave us the, the time periods, but for that last quote, what was the approximate year? Um, that is in Harrisburg in 1848. Seems like it could have been written uh, much more recently than yes. that. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Um, well, do you have any anything for me? I mean, I called you with um, some big nebulous ideas and questions, and uh, but you understood right away what I was asking. I wanted to know, I think this is the first call in Philadelphia to really link these um, in the current moment, to mm -hmm. link through programming. Mm -hmm. Juneteenth through July 4th, and it's so resonant, as you said, this year. So I was, I was wondering, what did you have in mind? Um, what would you like to see happen? And I would love, actually, for us, after you speak, to have people be able to turn to each other and maybe discuss that for a second among themselves. Like, what would you like to see happen between these two holidays? Yeah, actually, thank you for that. So that, that is your assignment. Uh, you will, uh, please think, um, you know, think about. Um, Turn to your neighbor and say, right. neighbor. <laughs> what do you see? What is the connection? Uh, for me, I, I've been thinking about, um, and we have been dwelling in spaces that, that sort of made me think about the connection between July 4th and Juneteenth. Uh, I think about that fortnight to freedom. I'm, I'm alliterative and corny, so, you know, that's our fortnight between freedom and liberty uh, for us to really reflect uh, for a change. But there's some, you know, to get a little bit personal. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up taking the trip to the old courthouse to reenact and, and rediscover the Dred Scott decision, mm. um, which was told to us pretty clinically. It wasn't told to us as injustice, by the way. Mm. It was just taught as this is how it was. I grew up going to a July 4th festival in St. Louis, Missouri called uh, the VP Fair. VP is the initials for Veiled Prophet. The Veiled Prophet Society is basically an offshoot of the Klan in St. Louis, Missouri. So at a point where I began to ask questions and think critically about American history and about the way we commemorate things, I learned about the legacy of the, the VP Fair and the Veiled Prophet. At the same time, I decided I wasn't gonna keep hearing the word Juneteenth without asking what it meant. And so I made a, a flip-flop in an exchange in my life a long time ago. I wanna commemorate and understand the day my, my ancestors in theory became free, and that's more important than understanding an incomplete declaration of independence. Now I'm a father, I work at a museum downtown in a historic district, and I believe we should have it all. I believe that there's an if-then statement. If the emancipation of enslaved Africans in this country was indeed a turning point and a, and a day that America's soul was saved, well then we ought to think about it and talk about it just as loudly and commemorate it just as, you know, importantly um, as we do all of these other days, but especially uh, Independence Day is sitting there for us, yeah. waiting for us to highlight the connection. I mean, so that's, that's literally, you know, the thoughts that cook for a couple of years before I'm able to articulate them and, and then work with our staff to make it happen. Um, but, but for me, it's a chance for our museum to continue in an iterative way uh, to deepen the conversation we've been having with our communities for 45 years. Juneteenth, by the way, is our birthday every year. So hmm. in a very practical way, I am always, and we're always thinking about that corridor of experience between June 19th and July 4th. Wait, How wait, wait, you need to community? back up. So you're saying that AMP, 40 years ago, was founded on June 19th, on Juneteenth. 45 years ago, um, 
on the occasion of the nation's bicentennial celebration here in Philadelphia. The African American Museum in Philadelphia is among legacy institutions which were started at that time. But the bicentennial, of course, was going to kick off on July 4th. Right. So we still even knew, even then, that linkage. This museum is going to open a few weeks before that on a day that's a day of rebirth and renewal and a certain declaration of independence for black communities. I mean, so I, I trace that through line, and uh, that's, that's our launch pad. That's, uh, those are the soldiers, shoulders we stand on and give us an opportunity to expand the dialogue from there. Uh, so that, that's really the motivation um, in the simplest way I can put it. Um, and that's the thing that led me to call you. I love hearing about people's journeys, you know, sort of your personal journeys to this holiday, right? You know, I'm, I'm from Chicago, where right. you were born. Born in Chicago. Right? And the Bud Billiken Parade is the longest, you know, it's the biggest black parade in the United States. What holidays did you guys celebrate coming up? How many of you celebrated Juneteenth coming up? Yeah. How many of you celebrated some other Emancipation Day, like Emancipation Day or Watch Night? How many of you went to Watch Night? Okay, so many more people went to watch night. So that's a, that resonates, right? How many of us knew that watch night was con connected to the Emancipation Proclamation and waiting for that? I have Not, no idea. No idea, okay, all right. So, um, so, I mean, this is, you know, living legacy, right? You know, like we imbue holidays with new meaning. And we know this because, you know, I love Kwanzaa and it's a new holiday, right? We imbue it with new meaning. And Juneteenth is one of those days, right, that we can now claim and imbue with new meaning. But we also have to figure out what are our personal journeys to it and what do we want to happen. How many of you did July 4th stuff? How many of you guys did July 4th stuff? Yeah, everybody, almost everybody did July 4th stuff. And, um, and how many of you felt a, a little queasy about or, or paradoxical, right, about, okay, <laughs> all right, all right, right, you know? So again, what is this kind of question of, what, so can we talk to each other, and I want to talk to you, Ivan, about what is, there's the personal journey, and then there is the brilliant programmer, right? And I think all of us are programmers in our own life, right, too? What do you want to see as the programming, as the most, what would you like to see in what you just called, oh, I had it just a minute ago, the fortnight between freedom and independence? Well, for me, it's, um that opportunity for reflection, but uh, to take steps through it. I want everyone in the world to know um, what Juneteenth is about, what, it, what was accomplished uh, when you know, Af enslaved Africans in Galveston, Texas found out they were free, but also what promises weren't, weren't, weren't uh, realized and which ones still have yet to be realized. But also understand for every step of understanding, I'm asking a person to take towards me and my beliefs that I also have to be willing to take a step in their direction as well, or at least con or at least admit that they have moved. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think we want to keep that sort of two-sided or multi-sided awareness of the moves, mental moves we're asking people to make by drawing the connection between these two these two uh, commemorations. It doesn't hurt, once again, that Senate and uh, the Congress, of course, passes this, uh, and it'll be a law soon if when Biden signs it. So that doesn't hurt. I think it helps, uh, but what I really want is an opportunity for reflection. We are a comfortable forum for uncomfortable conversations, and so I want us to get in here, roll up our sleeves, sweat, get dirty, and emerge better because of it. I've wanted that every year through our museum work, but after this year, we have to, you know, I hear build back better. Mm. <laughs> we have to emerge from this past year forever changed and willing to do things we haven't tried to do before. Um, and so that's the other reason that we said out loud, this was the connection we wanted to make this year. We want to do it methodically, um, start with Juneteenth and, and, and deal, deal and dwell heavily in that space early in this fortnight. But as we push towards July 4th, the thing that is most familiar perhaps to most folks is where we really want to make another turn. Our, our second major um, speaker will come on July 1st to help take us into that 18th century era for African Americans and also show the significance of, of what we contributed there, what was and was not included in that declaration for us. Um, and once again, I want us to always be uh, aware of the context. We are feet away from the whispering bells of freedom 
which are you know dedicated to the memory of Crispus Attucks, that, that first person who gave their life for the cause of revolution for this nation. I mean, so I always want us to remember the context um, and build bridges of understanding to that through line um, of agency and activism. So two things you mentioned I also have to say. I'm a museum guy, I'm a museum nerd. I love our core exhibition. You mentioned Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who is uh, one of our featured folks in our core exhibition, Audacious Freedom, who very famously wrote the poem, Bury Me in a Free Land. I want us to start at AMP and start in our minds and, and take journeys through the internet, but I also want us to physically go to the places and activate the spaces where so much history lived and where it still dwells. Half of those famous African Americans, those who would have, whose names would have appeared in the Pennsylvania uh, located color conventions events, those who are lived and died in our audacious freedom era are buried in historic Eden Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And in fact, drawn from multiple cemeteries over the past century for good reasons and for bad reasons, but now they're all congregated together in one place, along with Francis Ellen Watkins Harper who is indeed buried in a free land along with Octavius Valentine Cato and so many other names that we know from this era. And so I want us to live um, in a space that is affirming and, and, and literally get up to our knees in the evidence of who we are and what we've done. Like you said, we don't know enough about color conventions projects, that type of agency and forethought. And I think if we did know more, the things that happened yesterday um, and this week would be no surprise to us. They would really seem like they're long overdue and not nearly enough. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of where we are um, and where I am in terms of how important I believe this is for our institution. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't think we've been able to see each other in a long time. No. So if folks want to turn to their neighbors um, and actually have that conversation about what it is that um, you would like to see happen between Juneteenth or on Juneteenth and July 4th. If you feel comfortable doing that, um, and then um, let's just take a moment and actually talk to each other. It's been a long, has it been a long time? Is that all right with you all? All right, come on, let's do it for three or four minutes. We can talk to each other about what you'd like to see happen and any questions you have for us. And also, what have you seen happen? Uh, what, what have been your Juneteenth traditions or even those you've read about? I want to thank everybody for uh, taking a moment to speak to your neighbor. And um, I actually want to encourage you to keep it rolling. Um, but I also want to ask if anybody has anything they want to share uh, about what they have done um, around Juneteenth or what they want to see, um, especially in, in light of this being uh, you know, on the doorstep of being a, a federal holiday. Um, what is Juneteenth and in, in, in action what could it mean to you? Somebody, anybody, not everybody at once. Yes, sir. I grew up in Houston, Texas, about 50 miles from Galveston. Every year on the news at Juneteenth, there was news coverage of celebrations. Everybody had barbecues, and I tell you what, they went all out. They didn't just show up, they showed out. And so uh, I was familiar with that. And then also familiar uh, because it was a little hard to hide when you asked, well, what's all this about? And they actually did tell the truth at that point that it was about the Emancipation Proclamation reaching Galveston, Texas. But that was it. That was all that was said about it. Nothing else, nothing about uh, the hundreds of years that went before, the, sl the toil, the blood, the tears, everything. No, that was just completely smoothed over, and it was just like, uh, you know, this is, this is what it means. So what I'd like to see in between um, Juneteenth and July 4th is people to be taught what went on what went on for 450 years? It didn't happen under a bushel, as it says in scripture. I mean, it was out in the open. It wasn't talked about a lot, but it was out in the open. People died, people suffered, 
people bled. What we need to do is let people know. Let people know. Thank you for sharing. If you would. Okay, how you doing? I'm Elisa, one of the docents here at the African American Museum, and I'd like to agree with this gentleman here. I think these venues are so important. I think one of the problems we have living here in America is the absence of truth. And we need more truth talking. I want to tell you, your discussion was wonderful. Ivan's, your questions were wonderful. But we need more of this. And this is what happens here at the African American Museum. Thank you. into Juneteenth, but what I would like to see from Juneteenth to July 4th is that, I'm sorry, let me right here. <laughs> what I would like to see more is that the people, everyone recognizes and acknowledges our history and where we came from in our culture, but they also build upon that and move forward to create an inclusive environment. Like in schools, we, we celebrate Black History Month, but we only celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other historical people, and that is important, but it is also important that they say, hey, this happened, but also we didn't get freed. The African Americans didn't get freed on July 4th, we were freed, we had a sense of freedom on Juneteenth and introduced that to children so they, so the future generations won't have to grow up wondering what is this holiday and why are there parades and celebrations of it when I don't know what's going on. They should be able to just look around them or pick up a book and be able to understand where they came from and how long it took and the, and the work that our ancestors put in to get us to this point and that's what I would like to see. And I also want to read what I filled in the blanks for the declaration. Thank you. Okay. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He has plundered our hopes and inspiration, ravaged our dreams, destroyed the lives of our families, taking away our birthright, abolishing our most valuable expressions, and altering fundamentally the forms of our existence. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. Our ancestors, our, our ancestors taken captive on the high seas to bear this inequity. But we, st we shall still come together to foster our livelihoods and provide a form of hope for future generations. Thank you. Yes, we have our next speaker for next year. My name is Patrice Campbell and I'm retiring now from the city of Philadelphia. I think it's important though that we, whatever happens when we express African American history is part of American history. It's history for everyone, black, white, yellow, red. There are histories not being spoken of that are identical to ours in the treatment such as the Native Americans. Almost none of us here will have to admit we know very little about them and they still exist in our country today. So to be expressive of any history, I hope that all the celebrations or all the things we do, we start to expand it as a learning process for everyone and inclusive of everyone. If it becomes just a black celebration, it will be nothing to millions of others. But if it becomes part of the American celebration, including of whites or blacks or all of us, then they participate in that. They share in our common history, the good and the bad. And we recognize those of all races who worked hard. It was not just blacks who did it by themselves. 
is also the fact that many whites, many Native Americans, many Latinos, Hispanics, all fighting women for the suffragettes, fighting about many things that are interwoven. So I would like to see Juneteenth celebrated by, as an American holiday for everyone, with black history as a part of that, as well as the meaning of that for them to understand. Thank you. Um, you know, the Declaration of Independence doesn't mention African Americans, but it does mention Native Americans and um, calls them savages in a founding document, right? Um, and so to think through how little we know um, about the ground we literally stand on, right? Um, and to think through that that poem declaration, again, doesn't ever mention, right? It's inclusive. That R could be any group of people who have been, you know, really um, excluded from the cover of uh, the founding documents. Other folks, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Rodney Grayson. Uh, I'm not from Philadelphia, but one thing I was truly impressed by City Hall, if you ever walk through and look at the architecture, at the top of the pillars, there's every culture represented holding up the building. And I, 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 that, that's basically what Juneteenth is about. It's about all of us. We got Chinese, and it's not just one black person there. All different kinds of black people, white, Chinese, Indian. It, it's amazing. And I think um, we sort of lost track of what this country was about. I mean, right from the beginning, really. But uh, if we could sort of just get more honesty, like someone said, and get, and get things right, we could do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're great. Hi, I have two. First, to piggyback on the last two people, I thought I had a really good education, but I did not learn about Emancipation Park. I did not learn about Japanese internment camps. I did not learn, like, they kind of glossed over the whole reservation things with, the, with Native Americans, but very, very little. So I like education. I would like education to be in these next two weeks for all of us, as the last two speakers said. And then the other part is I work in health access and uh, it's amazing. It is amazing what we're dying from and how like my thing is colorectal cancer and it's completely preventable, 90%. However, 42% of black people that get it die. And it's, it's just ridiculous. So I think access to to education and knowledge about things that will help us, of uh, the, the black banks that are coming up. I, I've heard of them, I haven't looked them up on email on um, Google so much, but to learn more about them and maybe possibly find a, have a place to get an account. So access to education and resources and things that will make our lives better. Thank you. Come on up. And, and as you are, I'll say go get your tests go get your screenings right. right hi everyone my name is dolly um what i would like to see is i just want to encourage everyone to know their history and to reclaim their history i am uh i am my family's historian and genealogist and for the past 10 years i have discovered um amazing things that have answered a lot of questions um that I've always asked that tell me why I am the way I am. Um, you know how they say it's in your family's DNA? Well, it's in my DNA. So um, one thing that really resonated um, with me is the colored conventions. I have um, a great grandfather who was instrumental in the state of New Jersey who led um, the colored convention. He was a delegate. Um, to Trenton, and he was also in the state senate. No one knows this. I'm the one that's uncovered this for my family. I'm restoring that information to my family. I'm actually working on a book right now, and um, it's, it's amazing that this one individual who's my maternal grandfather, um, his name is William H. Jones, he died in 1900, um, and my, it's my mother's grandfather. She never knew him because he died long before she was born. And this man's legacy has been hidden for 150 plus years. So it's, it's amazing um, what I've discovered. I'm actually, 
I was supposed to do it last spring, but when the pandemic happened, I'm going to be participating at the Trenton State House, um, following in his footsteps. He was a doorkeeper, and I'm going to become a doorkeeper. <laughs> so that's, that, that's 360. Um, so I encourage everyone to do your genealogy, um, do um, archival research, because I found a lot of things in newspapers. And my ancestor has over 200 newspaper articles written about him alone. So that's how I discovered all of these things, all of his activities, the minutes, um, what he did, what they spoke about. He even spoke in Washington, D.C. I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar about the, the Lodge Law, Henry Cabot Lodge. He even spoke as a representative, and no one knows this. So I'm uncovering this, and I encourage you to do the same because you're going to find an ancestor that was a part of this movement because it was a huge movement. My ancestor was active from, he was a Civil War veteran as well and out of Philadelphia, and he was active from the 1880s up until the day he died in 1900. He died at the age of 53 of a cold, because um, he had a heart condition and cold ballooned into pneumonia, but um, do the research, it's there. It's hidden and it's waiting, it's waiting for the world to, waiting for us to reclaim. Thank you. I wanna, um, I wanna thank everyone um, who, who said something. Do we have one more? This one, come on, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Labor. I'm reluctant because white people take up too much space, a lot. And uh, I'm 72, so I've had a lot of experience with that. I would love to see Ju this. Uh, I love the religious connections that you made, Dr. Foreman, because I, I do education of white Catholics about racism, which means I won't be out of a job for a long time. <laughs> But mu much of what I've learned has been from your generation. I don't remember your name, Miss. Lanaya's generation. I, I still, this is my, I'm embarrassed to say, I've lived in Philadelphia for 40 years. This is the first time I've been to the AMP. I'm, but now I'm gonna join. And I would love to see your generation take over for those two weeks because, and I root it back to an experience I had when I worked at a college uh, Cabrini out in the suburbs and took a group of students to New York because Frances Cabrini had come and she's the patroness of immigrants and we were going to Ellis Island and hearing the talk about we're all immigrants and my student from she was from New York you know I'm not my ancestors were not immigrants they were kidnapped and some of them were Native Americans and this was their land and so it was like a light bulb went off for everybody who heard her. She was you know, a few years older than you, about 1920. And so she set me off on a journey that I am, God's not finished with me yet, got a lot to learn, but I would love to see really leaning in and listening to uh, poets like the one who read, I can't think of her name now, Amanda Gorman who spoke and read a poem, and you just read a beautiful poem. I'd love to see the younger generation help us weave the past and the present and the future. So thank you so much. So I want to thank everybody uh, for speaking up and for building a, a little bitty, tiny, effective community on the spot um, to, to explore a few ideas. Now, I can't help but call our youngest visitors my favorite visitors. Um, young lady, Miss, Miss, Miss Watson. Miss Lanaya Watson. Uh, Miss Lanaya Watson. Um, you had me in tears. It doesn't take much, uh, <laughs> but you had me in tears. You know, you, you hear about, I'm the, you know, I'm the product of my ancestors' wildest dreams and, and those sorts of quotes. I mean, you are, you standing up, taking a microphone and speaking to us. I'm about to do it. It was, why, it was everything. It's why this holiday matters, um, is the best thing I can say. But also the, the larger points. They're not about 1865 or what happened after emancipation. It's about taking ourselves back. We've been stealing ourselves back. We've been restoring ourselves and rebuilding ourselves. And it's about continuing on that path by any means necessary and using every tool that's available to us 
And as well as I can learn that, and as well as Dr. Foreman knows that, you are the one who's gonna advance the ball. So I thank you all for being here today and for sharing in this moment. Uh, but I'm telling you, we gotta pass these moments and ownership of these moments to the people who are gonna live them. Um, so thank you, thank you, um, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foreman. And thank God for today. Thank you for being here.